Warsaw Convention is constitutional, place of destination versus agreed stopping place, where action for damage may be filed. Santos III versus Northwest Orient Airlines, GR 101538. Facts. Petitioner is a minor resident of the Philippines. Private respondent, Northwest Orient Airlines, or NOAA, is a foreign corporation with principal residence in Minnesota, USA, and licensed to do business and maintain a branch office in the Philippines. The petitioner purchased from NOAA a round-trip ticket in San Francisco, USA, on December 19, 1986. The petitioner checked in at the NOAA counter in the San Francisco airport for his departure to Manila. Despite a previous confirmation and reconfirmation, he was informed that he had no reservation for his flight for Tokyo to Manila. He therefore had to be waitlisted. On March 12, 1987, the petitioner sued NOAA for damages in RTC Makati. NOAA moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground of lack of jurisdiction. Issue. Whether or not Article 28, Number 1 of the Warsaw Convention is in accordance with the Constitution so as to deprive the Philippine Court's jurisdiction over the case. Held. Article 28, Number 1. An action for damage must be brought at the option of the plaintiff in the territory of one of the high contracting parties, either before the court of the domicile of the carrier or his principal place of business, or where he has a place of business through which the contract has been made, or before the court at the place of destination. Supreme Court held that the Warsaw Convention is a treaty commitment voluntarily assumed by the Philippine government and, as such, has the force and effect of law in this country. On the question of jurisdiction, Supreme Court found that the foregoing provision of the Warsaw Convention enumerated the four places where an action for damages may be brought. Petitioner contended that since Manila is his place of destination, then the action was properly filed, but Supreme Court held otherwise. The place of destination within the meaning of the Warsaw Convention is determined by the terms of the contract of carriage or, specifically in this case, the ticket between the passenger and the carrier. Examination of the petitioner's ticket shows that his ultimate destination is San Francisco. Although the date of the return flight was left open, the contract of carriage between the parties indicates that NOAA was bound to transport the petitioner to San Francisco to Manila. Manila should therefore be considered merely an agreed stopping place. The contract is a single undivided operation, beginning with a place of departure and in ending with the ultimate destination. The use of the singular in this expression indicates the understanding of the parties to the convention that every contract of carriage has one place of departure and one place of destination. An intermediate place where the carriage, carriage may be broken is not regarded as a place of destination. Limited liability of international carriers, exception, airlines, negligence. Sabina Belgian World Airlines vs. CA, GR104685. Facts. Ma Paul Augustine was a passenger of one of the planes of Defendant Airlines. Her flight plan was from Casablanca to Manila with stopover in Brussels, Belgium. When she arrived in Manila, she found that her luggage was missing. After reporting the matter to Defendant, she was notified that the Brussels office of the airline found it and that they will be shipping it to Manila. However, she was informed that her luggage was lost for the second time, thus this claim for damages in an amount equivalent to the value of the luggage, but defendant denied liability, citing Augustine's own negligence, and that if they are liable or quindle, the liability is limited only to $20 per kilo due to Augustine's failure to declare a higher value. Issue, whether or not the airlines is entitled to limited liability held. Supreme Court held in the negative. The loss of said baggage of the private respondent have not only once but twice. This underscores the wanton negligence and lack of care of the part of the carrier. Because of such, this forecloses whatever rights petitioner might have had to the possible limitation of liabilities enjoyed by international air carriers under the Warsaw Convention. Moreover, the prescribed Warsaw Con Convention limited on aircraft liability cannot invoked in the case but rather the domestic law and jurisprudence, the Philippines being the country of destination. It states that the attendance of gross negligence, given the equivalent of fraud or bad faith, holds the common carrier liable for all damages, which can be reasonably attributed, although unforeseen to the non-performance of the obligation, including moral and exemplary damages. Warsaw Convention Not Absolute Limit on Extent 
of Airlines Liability. Northwest Airline versus CAGR number 120334. Facts. Rolando Torres allegedly on a special mission to purchase firearms for the Philippine Senate purchased a round trip ticket from defendant Northwest Airline for his travel to Chicago and back to Manila via defendant's flight. Torres left for the U.S. after purchasing firearms and upon arrival in Manila, one of the baggages could not be claimed, allegedly because Northwest sent it back to the U.S. for U.S. Customs verification. The baggage was eventually returned, but when Torres opened it, the firearms were missing. A personal property missing damage report was subsequently filed, but Northwest continuously re refused to settle the case amicably, thus prompting Torres to file this claim for actual, moral, temporary, and exemplary damages and attorney's fees. For its part, Northwest argued that granting Arguento the firearms were lost, its liability was limited to $9.07 per round or $640 in total under the Warsaw Convention. Whether or not Northwest is entitled to the limited liability under the Warsaw Convention, Supreme Court held that Northwest liability for actual damages may not be limited to that prescribed in Section 22 No. 2 of the Warsaw Convention as held in Alitalia v. Intermediate Appellate Court. The Warsaw Convention does not operate as an, as an exclusive enumeration of the instances of an airline's liability or as an absolute limit of the extent of that liability. Such a proposition is not borne out by the language of the convention. Moreover, slight reflection readily leads to the conclusion that it should be deemed a limit of liability only in those cases where the cause of debt or injury to person or destruction, loss or damage to property or delay in its transport is not attributable to or attended by any willful misconduct bad faith, recklessness, or otherwise improper conduct on the part of any official or employee for which the carrier is responsible, and there is otherwise no special or extraordinary form of resulting injury. The Convention's provisions, in short, do not regulate or exclude liability for other breaches of contract by the carrier or misconduct of its office officers and employees, or for some particular exceptional type of damage. When airline not liable, force majeure exceptions. Japan Airlines vs. CA, GR 118-664. Facts. On June 13, 1991, private respondent Jose Miranda boarded JAL flight number JL001 in San Francisco, California, bound for Manila. Likewise, on the same day, Enrico Agana, his wife, and his daughter left Los Angeles for Manila via JAL flight or Japan Airlines flight number JL061. As an incentive for traveling on Japan Airlines, both flights were to make an overnight stopover at Narita, Japan, at the airline's expense thereafter proceeding to Manila the following day. However, while in Japan, Mount Pinatube in the Philippines erupted, causing unrelenting ash fall and rendering Naia inaccessible to airline traffic. Hence, their flight to Manila was delayed indef indefinitely. At first, JAL rebooked all the Manila-bound passengers and offered to pay for their hotel expenses for their unexpected overnight stay. However, because of Naia's indefinite closure, this flight was again cancelled. At this point, JAL informed them that it would no longer defray their hotel and accommodation expenses during their stay in Narita. When they eventually got to Manila, they commenced an action for damages against JAL. Issue Whether Japan Airlines, as a common carrier, has the obligation to shoulder the hotel and meal expenses of its stranded passengers until they have reached their final destination, even if the delay were caused by force majeure. Held. The general rule is that a party is not liable if the non-performance is due to force majeure. Since the eruption of the Mount Pinatuba is such force majeure, JEL therefore cannot be charged for whatever losses or damages incurred. Supreme Court held that to hold Japan Airlines in the absence of bad pay, fate, or negligence liable for the amenities of its stranded passengers by reason of a fortuitous event is too much of a burden to assume. However, Supreme Court did not completely absolve JEL from any liability. It must be noted that private respondents brought tickets from the United States with Manila as their final destination, while JEL was no longer required to defer private respondents' leaving expenses during their stay in Narita. On account of the fortuitous event, JEL had a duty to make the, to make the necessary arrangements 
to transport private respondents on the first available connecting flight to Manila. JAL is not excused from the obligation to make the necessary arrangements to transport private respondents on its first available flight to Manila. After all, it had a contract to transport private respondents from the United States to Manila as their final destination. Consequently, the award of nominal damages is in order. Two-year prescriptive period does not apply to torts and when lapse is due to airlines delaying tactics. United Airlines v. UI, GR127768, facts. Will UI is a passenger of United Airlines bound for San Francisco to Manila. While in San Francisco, it was found that one piece of his luggage was over the maximum weight limit, for which a United Airlines personnel re rebuked him in a loud voice in front of the miling crowd ordered him to repack his things. But even after repacking, his luggage was still overweight, forcing Willie to pay for the excess with the use of his miscellaneous charge order, MC. United Airlines, however, refused to honor it on account of some discrepancies in the figures. So Willie had to use his American Express credit card instead. Upon arrival in Manila, he discovered that one of his bags had been slashed and its contents stolen. Willie sent a letter of demand to United Airlines which only offered to pay him the value of $9.70 per pound. Willie, however, rejected the offer and sent two more demand letters, which were ignored, thus prompting him to file a complaint for damages with the Philippine courts based on torts and the loss of his luggage. United Airlines moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground that it was filed beyond the two-year prescriptive period under the Warsaw Convention. Issue whether or not the action for damages is barred by prescription. Held, Supreme Court held that although the two-year prescriptive period under Warsaw Convention had already lapsed by the time Willie filed the complaint for damages, this did not preclude the application of pertinent provisions of the Civil Code. Thus, the action for damages could still be filed based on tort, which can be filed within four years from the time cause of action occurred. As for the action pertaining to the loss of the contents of the luggage, while it was well within the bounds of the Warsaw Convention, Supreme Court found that there was an exception, the applicability of the two-year prescriptive period, that is when the airline employed delayed tactics and gave the passenger the runaround. Overbooking of flight is bad faith, Lex Lossi Contractus, law of the place where ticket was issued governs. Salamea v. CA, GR104, Two, three, five. Facts. The Salamea spouses and their daughter purchased three airline tickets from the Manila agent of respondent Transworld Airlines, TWA, for a flight to New York to Los Angeles. The tickets of the spouses were purchased at a discount of 75%, while that of their daughter was a full fare ticket. All three tickets represented confirmed reservations. Once in New York, however, they found that their flight back to Manila was overbooked, as a result which they had to be waitlisted. Out of those waitlisted, the ones with full fare tickets were preferred, thus only the Salamea husband, who was holding his daughter's ticket, was able to get on board, while his wife and daughter had to wait for the next flight. However, it turned out this next flight was likewise overbooked, forcing the Salameas to purchase tickets from another airline. Later, they sued TWA for breach of contract in the Philippines. Issue, whether or not TWA is liable for breach of contract held. Supreme Court held in the affirmative. Overbooking of flight amounts to fraud or bad faith, entitling plaintiff to an award of moral damages because of bad faith attending the breach of contract. The holding that overbooking was allowed under U.S. federal regulations was found erroneous because 1. This regulation was not proved and our courts can take judicial notice of it and 2. Even if such regulation was proven, the rule of Lex Lossi Contractus negates its application. According to this rule, the law of the place where the airline ticket was issued should be applied by the court where the passengers are residents and nationals of the forum and the ticket is issued in such state by the defendant airline. Since tickets were sold and issued in the Philippines, the applicable law in this case would be Philippine law. Under our jurisprudence, overbooking of flight is bad faith. Moreover, 
The hierarchy of tickets practiced by TWA was evidence of its self-interest over that of its passengers, which Supreme Court held to be improper considering the public interest involved in a contract of carriage. Succession and Property Succession Extrinsic Validity and Probate of Wills Extrinsic validity of wills is governed 1. By the laws of the country where the dissident is a national 2. By the laws of the country where the will was executed 3. By the laws of the country where the dissident is a resident 4. By Philippine laws Intrinsic validity of wills is governed by the national law of the dissident Reprobate of a will. VDA de Press versus Tolete, GR 76714. The Kunana spouses were merely Filipino but became American citizens and residents of New York, each executed a will, also in New York, containing provisions on presumption of survivorship. In case of doubt, husband presumed to have died first. Later, the entire family perished in fire that gutted their home. Rafael, the trustee of the Conanan husband's will, filed for separate probate proceedings of both wills. Meanwhile, Salud Perez, the Conanan wife's mother, filed a petition for reprobate of her daughter's will in Bulacan, without notifying the husband's heir. Rafael opposed the reprobate, arguing that New York law should govern and under which law Salud is not an heir, but he and his brothers and sisters are. For her part, Salud claimed that she was her daughter's sole heir and that two wills were in accordance with New York law before she could present evidence to prove New York's law. However, the reprobate court disallowed the wills. Issue, whether or not the will should be allowed, held. Supreme Court held that petitioner should be allowed to present evidence for reprobate of wills and that notice should be given to Raphael and the other heirs. To allow the wills proof that both conform to the formalities prescribed by New York laws or by Philippine laws is imperative. Evidence required are as follows. Due execution of the will in accordance with the foreign laws. 2. Testator has his domicile in the foreign country and not in the Philippines. 3. The will has been admitted to probate in such country. 4. The fact that the foreign tribunal is a probate court. And 5. The laws of the foreign country on procedure and allowance of wills, except for the first and last requirements, the petitioner submitted all the needed evidence. The necessity of presenting evidence on the foreign laws upon which the probate and the foreign country is impelled by the fact that our courts cannot take judicial notice of them. Situs of shares of stocks, power of ancillary administrator, actual situs of shares of stocks. Tayag v. Benguet Consolidated, GR 23145. Facts. Idona Slade Perkins, an American citizen who died in New York City, left, among others, two stock certificates issued by Benguet Consolidated, a corporation domiciled in the Philippines. As ancillary administrator of Perkins' estate in the Philippines, Tayag now wants to take possessions of these stock certificates, but County Trust Company of New York the domiciliary administrator refused to part with them. Thus, the probate court of the Philippines was forced to issue an order declaring the stock certificates of loss and ordering Benguet Consolidated to issue new stock certificates representing Perkins shares. Benguet Consolidated appealed the order arguing that the stock certificates are not lost and they are in existence and currently in the possession of County Trust Company of New York. Issue whether or not the order of the lower court is proper. The appeal lacks merit. Tayag, as ancillary administrator, has the power to gain control and possession of all assets of the dissident within the jurisdiction of the Philippines. There can be more than one administration of an estate. When a person dies in the state owing property in the country of his domicile, as well as in the foreign country, administration is had in both countries. That which is granted in the jurisdiction of dissident's last domicile is termed the principal administration, while any other administration is termed the ancillary administration. The reason for the latter is because a grant of administration does not ex proprio vigor have any effect beyond the limits of the country in which it is granted. Hence, 
an administrator appointed in a foreign state has no authority in the Philippines. The ancillary administration is proper. Whenever a person dies living in a country other than that of his last domicile, property to be administered in the nature of assets of the deceased liable for his individual debts or to be distributed among his heirs. Probate court has authority to issue the order enforcing the ancillary administrator's right to the stock certificates when the actual situs of the shares of stocks is in the Philippines. It would follow then that the authority of the probate court to require the ancillary administrator's right to the stock certificates covering the 33,002 shares standing in her name in the books of Benguet Consolidated be, re re be respected is equally beyond question, for appellant is a Philippine corporation owing full allegiance and subject to the restricted jurisdiction of local courts. Its shares of stock cannot therefore be considered in any wise as immune from lawful court orders. Our holding in Wells Fargo Bank and Union versus Collector of Internal Revenue finds application in the instant case. The actual situs of the shares of stock is in the Philippines, the corporation being domiciled to the force of the above undeniable proposition, not even appellant is insensible. It does not dispute it, nor could it successfully do so, even if it were so minded. Law on Successional Rights National law of the dissident governs the following. 1. Amount of successional rights. 2. Order of succession. 3. Intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions. The foregoing are exemptions to the general rule of Lex Re Cite property lex loci re cite lex loci re cite governs both real and personal property but mobilia sequentur personam personal property follows the person still finds application in the sense that wherever a person may be that is also considered as the situs of his personal property shares of stock where the corporation which issued them is domiciled or is incor incorporated Exceptions to Lex Law Loci Recite 1. A matter which concerns only real property, incidentally, and which is in reality of a personal nature. 2. Treaty. Exception to prohibition, prohibition of aliens from owing land. Holy See has the status of a foreign sovereign. The Holy See versus Rosario, GR101949. Facts. A piece of real property was acquired by the Holy See by way of the name from the Archdiocese of Manila. The purpose was to construct the official place of residence of Papal Nunso. Nunso. Later, the Holy See sold the property on condition that it will evict the squatters therein. For failure to comply with the condition, the Holy See was sued. It moved to dismiss on the ground of state immunity. Issue. Whether a respondent's trial court has jurisdiction over petitioner being a foreign state enjoying sovereign immunity. Help. The Republic of the Philippines has accorded the Holy See the status of a foreign sovereign. The Holy See, through its ambassador, the Papal Nuncio, has had diplomatic re representation with the Philippine government since 1957. The privilege of sovereign immunity in this case was sufficiently established by the memorandum and certification of the Department of Foreign Affairs. The DFA has formally intervened in this case and officially certified that the Embassy of the Holy See is a duly accredited diplomatic mission to the Republic of the Philippines exempt from local jurisdiction and entitled to all the rights, privileges, and immunities of a diplomatic mission or embassy in this country. The determination of the executive arm of government that a state or instrumentality is entitled to sovereign or diplomatic immunity is a political question that is conclusive upon the courts. Where the plea of immunity is recognized and affirmed by the executive branch, it is the duty of the courts to accept this claim so as not to embarrass the executive arm of the government in conducting the country's foreign relations. If property is situated in a foreign country, lex loci re cite does not apply when there is no conflict of law situa situation. Laurel v. Garcia, GR92013. Facts. The Roppongi property is one of the four properties in Japan acquired by the Philippine government under the Reparations Agreement as part of the 
signification to the Filipino people for their losses in life and property and their suffering during World War II. The Roppongi property became the site of the Philippine Embassy until the latter was transferred to another site when the Roppongi building needed major repairs. Due to the failure for government to provide necessary funds, the Roppongi property has remained undeveloped since that time. After many years, the Aquino administration advanced the sale of the reparation properties, which included the Roppongi lot. This move was opposed on the ground that the Roppongi property is public in character. For their part, the proponents of the sale raised that Japanese law should apply following the doctrine of Lex Lo Loci Recite. Issue whether or not the conflict of law rule on Lex Loci Recite should apply. Held, we see no reason why a conflict of law rule should apply when no conflict of law situation exists. A conflict of law situation arises only when 1. There is a dispute over the title or, of, or ownership of an immovable, such that the capacity to take and transfer immovables, the formalities of conveyance, the essential validity and effects of the transfer, or the interpretation and effect of a conveyance are to be determined. C. Salonga, Private International Law. And 2. A foreign law on land ownership and its conveyance is asserted to conflict with the domestic law on the same matters, hence the need to determine which law should apply. In the instant case, none of the above elements exist. The issue are not concerned with validity of ownership or title. There is no question that the property belongs to the Philippines. The issue is the authority of the respondent officials to validly dispose of property belonging to the state, and the validity of the procedures adopted to effect, effect its sale. This is governed by Philippine law. The rule of Lex Sidus does not apply. The assertion that the opinion of the Secretary of Justice sheds light on the relevance of the Lex Sidus rule is misplaced. The opinion does not tackle the alienability of the real properties procured through reparations nor the existence in what body of the authority to sell them. In discussing who are capable of acquiring the lots, the Secretary merely explains that it is the foreign law which should determine who can acquire the properties so that the constitutional limitation on acquisition of lands of the public domain to Filipino citizens and in titles wholly owned by Filipinos is inapplicable. We see no point in belaboring whether or not this opinion is correct. Why should we discuss who can acquire the propongilat when there is no showing that it can be sold? Torts and Damages Law Governing Torts Damages rise from 1. Delict or crime 2. Quasi-delict tort 3. Negligence Lex Lossi Delicti The law of the place of where wrong was committed governs the actionable quality of nature of acts causing death or bodily injuries as tortious. But in order to recover the tortious act which ripened in another state must be actionable in the law of the place of wrong and in the law of the form. Lex Loci Commissi The law of the place where the injury, wrong, or death took place governs. Foreign laws must be alleged and proved. Wild Valley Shipping versus CA GR 119-602 Facts The Philippine Rojas, a vessel owned by Philippine President Lines, arrived in Puerto Ordas, Venezuela to load iron ore. After loading, the vessel was about to leave port when Vasquez, an official pilot of Venezuela, boarded the vessel in order to navigate it to the Orinoco River. As the vessel was navigating the Orinoco River with Vasquez as pilot, it ran aground, obstructing the ingress and egress of vessels, and the vessel of wild valley shipping was unable to sail out of Puerto Ordas on that day, claiming damages Wild Valley Shipping filed an action for damages against Philippine President Lines in the Macat, Manila RTC. The trial court held Philippine President Lines liable, but on appeal, CA reversed the decision whether or not Venezuelan is applicable to the case. Held. Supreme Court held that the pilotage law of Venezuela was not alleged or properly proven. A photocopy of the Gacita official whether said law was published, was 
presented in evidence as an official republication of the Republic of Venezuela. Likewise, only a photocopy of the rules on piloting the Orinoco River, as published in a book issued by the Ministerio de Comunicaciones of Venezuela. As foreign public documents, there should have been a certificate that Captain Monson, the, the attesting officer, is the officer who had legal custody of those records made by a secretary of the embassy or legation, consul general, consul, vice consul, or consular agent by any or by any officer in the foreign service of the Philippine station in Venezuela and authenticated by the seal of his office accompanying the copy of the public document. No such certificate could be found in the records of the case. In the absence of pleading and proof, the laws of a foreign country or state will be presumed to be the same as the domestic law, and this is known as processual presumption, thus applying the civil code, there being no contractual obligation, the master of the Philippine Rojas is obliged to give only the diligence required of a good father of the family. This was exercised by showing that the vessel sailed only after the main engine, machineries, and other auxiliaries were checked and found to be in good running condition. When the master left a competent officer, the officer in, on watch on the bridge with a pilot who is experienced in navigating the Orinoco River. When the master ordered the inspection of the vessel's double button tanks where the vibrations occurred anew. State of the most significant contracts rule. Saudi Arabia Airlines. Agreement of the parties as to applicable law. Contract stipulation not superior to law. Susara versus Benipayo, GR 57999. Filipino seaman, petitioners, Magsaysay Lines. Private respondent, petitioner seaman entered into a contract of employment with private respondent, which was verified and approved by the National Seaman Board, NSB. In the port of Vancouver, petitioner to a special agreement received additional wages under rates prescribed by the International Transport Worker Federation, ITF alleging that petitioners used force and violence in extracting the additional wages. Under the special agreement, private respondent filed a complaint against them with the NSB. Later in Nagoya, Japan, petitioners were made to sign an agreement in consideration of the dismissal of the case filed against them in the NSB. It appeared that the line, which amounts was or were received and held by the crew members in trust for ship owners, was inserted therein, thereby making it appear that the amount given to the petitioners representing the increase in their wages based on ITF rates were only received by them in trust for the private respondent. When the vessel reached Manila, the private respondent demanded from the petitioners the overpayments made to them in Canada. Issue, whether or not the petitioners are entitled to the amounts they receive from private respondent representing additional wages as determined in the special agreement, held. Supreme Court, in, Supreme Court held in the affirmative, the court found nothing to show for the alleged force and violence employed by petitioners to secure the special agreement in Vancouver, Canada. There was no need for any form of intimidation coming from the Filipino seamen because a strong Canadian labor union, backed by an international labor federation, was actually doing all the influencing. Moreover, when the petitioners entered into separate contracts between 1977 to 1978, the monthly minimum basic wage for able-bodied seamen ordered by NSB was still fixed at 130 U.S. dollars, whereas as early as 1976, the ILO already set the minimum basic wage at 187 U.S. dollars. Even so, it was only in 1979 that NSB adopted this international wage rate in its memorandum circular. Thus, it is not the fault of the petitioners that NSB not only violated the labor code which created it and the rules and regulations implementing the labor code but also seeks to punish the seaman for a shortcoming of the nsb itself as for the alleged inserted line in the agreement executed in japan supreme court found that it was an intercalation added after execution of the agreement and thus not binding nota bene it is a it is clear from this case that in controversies between workers and their foreign employers, Philippine agencies and the courts should take the working man's interest and that of the nation as a whole. This policy and lab labor protection is deemed 
read into any labor contract. Overseas Employment of Filipino Workers General Rule Law on, of the country where the physical injury or death of a person occurred governs the liability of the person responsible thereof or of the employer of the injured or deceased person as well as the amount of compensation which the injured or the ears would be entitled. Kilberg Doctrine The form is not bound by the law of the place of death as to the limitation on damages for wrongful death because such rule is procedural and hence the law of the form governs on this issue. Law of the form governs limitation on damages. Eastern Shipping Lines versus POEA Facts Vitaliano Sacco, the chief officer of a ship, was killed in an accident in Tokyo, Japan. The widow filed a complaint for damages against Eastern Shipping Lines with the POEA based on Memorandum Circular No. 2 issued by the latter. This circular prescribed a standard contract to be adopted by both foreign and domestic shipping companies in the hiring of Filipino seamen for overseas employment. Eastern Shipping Lines questioned the validity of the Memorandum Circular and contended that SACO is not an OFW but a domestic employee and, as such, is entitled only to the death benefits under the Labor Code lower amount. Issue Whether or not the widow is entitled to the death benefits under Memorandum Circular No. 2 held. On the issue of validity of the Mem Memorandum Circular, Supreme Court held that it was valid. The law creating the POEO provides, among others, that it shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction over all cases including money claims involving employer-employee relations arising out of or by virtue of any law or contract involving Filipino workers for overseas employment, including seamen. Clearly, then POEA has such delegated power to promulgate the question circular as an exception to the non-delegation principle. As to whether SACO is an OFW, Supreme Court found that Eastern Shipping Lines performed at least two acts which constitute implied or tacit recognition of the nature of SACO's employment at the time of his death in 1985. The first is its submission of its shipping articles to the POEA for processing, formalization and approval in the exercise of its regulatory power over overseas employment under EO-79. Seven. The second is its payment of the contributions mandated by law and regulations to the welfare fund for overseas workers. It is not denied that the private respondent has been receiving a monthly death benefit pension of 514 and 42 cents since March 1985 and that she was also paid 1,000 funeral benefit by the social security system. In addition, as already observed, she also received 5,000 real gratuity from the welfare fund for overseas workers. These payments will not preclude allowance of the private respondent's claim against the petitioner because it is specifically reserved in the standard contract of employment for Filipino seamen under Memorandum Circular No. 2 Series of 1984. Employers have responsibility to ensure employees' claim for insurance is allowed. Contracts favorable to employees are valid even if not approved by POEA. Siegel Maritime v. Balatongan, GR-822-52 Facts A crew agreement was entered into by Balatongan and Philimar Shipping and Equipment Supply, whereby the latter employed the former as able seaman on board his vessel, Santa Cruz, renamed Turtle Bay with a monthly salary of $300. This agreement was approved by NSB. While on board said vessel, the parties entered into a supplementary contract of employment which provided for benefits in case of death or permanent total disability caused by accident. Later, Balatongan met an accident in the canal, Egypt, as a result of which he was permanently disabled. Thus, he demanded payment for his claim of total disability insurance in the amount of 50,000 US dollars as provided in the supplemental contract but this claim was denied for having been submitted to the insurers beyond the designated period period for doing so Balatongan however was able to obtain a ward of the claim from the POEA hence this appeal whether or not the employer can raise prescription of insurance claim as a defense to toward recovery by employee held Supreme Court held in the negative on the supplemental contract, having been approved by the POEA, 
Supreme Court held that while the law requires for such contracts to have prior approval of POEA, the purpose is to ensure that the employee shall not thereby be placed in a disadvantaged position and that the same are within the minimum standards of the terms and conditions of such employment contracts set by the POEA. However, there is no prohibi prohibition against stipulating in a contract more benefits to the employee than those required by law. Thus, in this case, wherein a supplementary contract was entered into affording greater benefits to the employee than that the previous one, and although the same was not submitted for approval of the POEA, the public respondents properly considered said contracts to be valid and enforceable. On the question of, of prescription, Supreme Court held that the employer responsible for the delay in its employee's claim. The private respondent met the accident on October 6, 1983. Since then, he was hospitalized at the Seuss Canal Authority Hospital, and thereafter he was repatriated to the Philippines, wherein he was also hospitalized from October 22, 1983 to March 27, 1984. It was only on August 19, 1985 that he was issued a medical certificate describing his disability to be permanent in nature. It was not possible for a private respondent to file a claim for permanent disability with the insurance company within the one-year period from the time of the injury, as his disability was ascertained to be permanent only thereafter. Petitioners did not exert any effort to assist private respondent to recover payment of his claim from the insurance company. They did not even care to dispute the finding of the insurer that the claim was not filed on time. Petitioners must, therefore, be held responsible for its omission, if not negligence, by requiring them to pay the claim of private respondent. Carriage of Goods by Sea Act Parties to a contract of carriage, ship owner, number two, shipper, three, ship agent of the vessel, four, cargo owner, five, consignee, six, insurance company, which insure the cargo or the vessel, matters under COGSA, one, liability, two, who is liable, three, Extent of liability. 4. Burden of proof. 5. Applicable prescriptive period. Loss or damage under COGSA. Prescription of claims. Mitsui OSK. Lines. Versus CA. GR 119571. Facts. Petitioner Mitsui OSK is a foreign corporation represented in the Philippines by its agents. Magsaysay. Agencies. It entered into a contract of carriage through Maester Transport. An international freight for water. With private respondent Levine Lunch Ware Manufacturing Corp. to transfer goods of the latter from Manila to Le Havre, France. However, the delivery was delayed, with the result that the consignee allegedly paid only half the value of the said goods on the ground that they did not arrive in France until the off season in that country. Thus, Levine Lunch Ware filed a case in the RTC for the damages incurred. For its part, Mitsui OSK filed a motion to dismiss, alleging that the claim against it had prescribed under COGSA. RTC denied the motion to dismiss, which order was affirmed by CA, hence this petition. Issue whether private respondents' action for loss or damage to goods is shipped is within the meaning of COGSA. Health. Supreme Court held that goods becoming off-season is not the loss of damage or contemplated under COGSA so that any action based on such loss or damage is not barred by the one-year prescriptive period under COGSA. Under COGSA, loss contemplates merely a situation where no delivery at all was made by the shipper of the goods because the same had perished, gone out of commerce, or disappeared in such a way that their existence is unknown or they cannot be recovered. Conformably with this concept of what constitute loss or damage, this court held in another case that the deterioration of goods due to delay in their transportation constitutes loss or damage within the meaning of COGSA, so that, as suit was not brought within one year, the action was barred. Said one-year period of limitation is designed to meet the exigencies of maritime hazards. However, in this case of bar, there is ne neither deterioration, nor disappearance, nor destruction of goods caused by the carrier's breach of contract. Whatever reduction there may be, have been in the value of the goods is not due to their deterioration or disappearance because they had been damaged in transit, but to other causes independent of the condition of the cargo upon arrival, 
like a drop in their market value. The question is not the particular sense of damages, as it refers to the physical loss or damage of a shipper's good, as specifically covered by COGSA, but petitioner's potential liability for the damages it has caused in the general sense. Thus, the question of prescription of action is governed not by the COGSA, but Article 1144 of the Civil Code, which provides for a prescriptive period of 10 years. Law of Country of Registry of Vessel The Philippines adhere to the rule that Philippine ship or airship is an extension of the territorial jurisdiction of the country. Law of the Flag Law of the Country of the Vessels Registry governs general rule. Foreign vessels entering Philippine ports or waters are beyond the jurisdiction of courts of this country. It matters concerning discipline and all things in the foreign ship affecting only the vessel and those belonging to her. Exception Matters which affect the peace and tranquility of the country, example, crime or torts, acts committed on board the vessel produce pernicious effects within the territory, offense against the law of nations, example, piracy, wrongful act or omission caused injury to the country's citizen. Local law is designed to protect seamen in Philippine ports. French rule Crimes committed aboard a foreign merchant vessel should not be prosecuted in the courts of the country within whose territorial jurisdiction they were committed, unless their commission affects the peace and security of the territory. English rule. Based on territorial principle, crimes perpetrated under such circumstances are in general triable in the course of the country within territory they were committed, followed by the U.S. and the Philippines. Exception to law of the flag. Pernicious effects to the country. People vs. Wong Cheng, GR 18924. Facts. Wong Cheng is a Chinese national on board a merchant vessel of English nationality anchored in Manila Bay, two and a half miles from the shores of the city. He was caught illegally smoking opium, an act violative of the opium law of the Philippines. The defense was that since he was on board a vessel registered in England, the Philippines has no jurisdiction over the crime. Issue. Whether or not the courts of the Philippines have jurisdiction over crime committed aboard merchant vessel anchored in our jurisdiction waters. Held. We have seen that the mere possession of opium aboard a foreign vessel in transit was held by this court, not triable by, or by our courts, because it being the primary object of our opium law to protect the inhabitants of the Philippines against the disastrous effect entailed by the use of this drug. Its mere possession is not considered a disturbance of the public order, but to smoke opium within our territorial limits, even though aboard a foreign merchant ship, is certainly a breach of the public order here established, because it causes such drug to produce its pernicious effect within our territory. It seriously contravenes the purpose of that of our legislature has in mind in enacting the aforesaid repressive statute. Where the collision occurred is immaterial, law of the flag governs National Development Company versus CA. Facts, NDP and MCP entered into an agreement by which NDP, as the first mortgagee of three ocean-going vessels, including the one with the name Donia Nati, appointed MCP as its agent to manage and operate said vessels in its behalf. E. Philip Corporation of New York loaded on board Donia Nati in San Francisco CA a total of 1,200 bales of American New Cotton consigned to Manila Banking Corp and the People's Bank and Trust Company, acting for it in behalf of Pan Asiatic Commercial Company, who represents Riverside Mills Corporation. The vessel figured in a collision at Ice Bay, Japan with a Japanese vessel as a result of which the aforesaid cargo was lost and or destroyed. Plaintiff Development and Insurance insured the corporation as insurer paid to Riverside Mills the amount of the damage and lost cargo, the latter being the holder of the negotiable bills of lading duly endorsed. As a result of such payment, said insurer filed an action to recover the amount from NDP and MCP. MCP contended that it cannot be held solidarily liable with NDC because it is not a ship agent, but a mere managing agent, and as such cannot be held liable if it did not exceed its authority. NDC likewise denied liability. Issue 
whether or not NDC and MCP are solidarily liable for each with each other. Help. NDC and MCP are solidarily liable. Where collision is imputable to the preserve of the vessel, the owner of the vessel at fault shall indemnify the losses and damages incurred after an expert appraisal. Moreover, if the collision is imputable to both vessels, each one shall bear its own damages, and both shall be solidarily liable for the loss sustained by their cargoes. The agreement between NDC and MCP shows that MCP is appointed as agent, a term broad enough to inherit the concept of ship agent in maritime law. In fact, MCP was even infused with all the powers of the owner of the vessel, including the power to contract in the name of NDC. Consequently, under the arrangement, MCP cannot escape liability. Both owner and agent should be declared jointly and severally liable since the obligation, which is the subject of the action, had its origin in a portion act and did not arise from contract. Consequently, the agent, even though he may not be the owner of the vessel, is liable to the shipper and miners of the cargoes transported by it. Note, note, only the collision occurred in foreign waters, Japan. The court applied Philippine law because the vessel was of Philippine registry. NDC and MCP are thus held to be common carriers who, by reason of public policy, are duty-bound to observe extraordinary diligence. Limited Liability Clause The stipulation as to the amount of liability for damage to cargo is binding unless the shipper declares a greater amount in their agreement. Declaration must be made a part of the bill of lading. Everett Steamship vs. CAGR 122494 Facts Private Respondent Hernandez Trading Company imported three crates of bus spare parts from its supplier. Maruman Trading, a foreign corporation based in Izanawa, Aichi, Japan. The crates were shipped to Manila on board a vessel owned by petitioner's principal, Everett Orient Lines. Upon arrival in Manila, one of the crates went missing, prompting Hernandez Trading to file a formal claim in an amount equivalent to that stated in the invoice, but Everett offered to pay only the amount stipulated in the limited liability clause contained in the bill of lading, which amount is lower than that stated in the invoice, whether or not the limited liability clause in the bill of lading is valid. Supreme Court held in the affirmative, the question stipulation is reasonable and just. In the bill of lading, the carrier made it clear that its liability would only be up to 100,000 yen. However, the shipper Maruman Trading had the option to declare a higher Valuation if the value of its cargo was higher than the limited liability of the carrier. Considering that the shipper did not declare a higher valuation, it had itself to blame for not complying with the stipulation. On the issue that the bill of lading is a contract of adhesion, Supreme Court held that such contract is not invalid. Supreme Court held that Mormon trading, having been extensively engaged in trade, cannot be said to be ignorant. Everett, even if only a consignee, and thus not a signatory to the contract, is bound by it. Supreme Court likened the contract of carriage to that of a contract entered in favor of a stranger, contract por aturi. Moreover, by seeking recovery for the loss of the goods, Everett is necessarily trying to enforce the contract, so it cannot now reject the stipulation. Lastly, the higher valuation in the invoice is irrelevant. For the shipper to recover a higher valuation, the declaration must be in writing and inserted in the bill of lading. Thus, the higher valuation in the invoice is of no moment since the same was not made a part of the bill of lading. Marriage and Dissolution of Marriage Marriage Lex Losi Celebrationis General Rule All marriages solemnized outside the Philippines is in accordance with the laws in force in the country where they were solemnized and valid there as such shall also be valid in the Philippines. Exception 1. Those contracted by any party below 18 years of age, even with the consent of his parents or guardians. Those bigamous and polygamous marriage not falling under Article 41. Those contracted through mistake of one of the contracting party as to the identity of the other. Those subsequent void marriages under Article 53. Psychological incapacity. And 6. Marriages void by reasons of public policy between brothers and sisters, whether full or half-blood, between collateral blood relatives, whether legitimate or illegitimate, up to the fourth civil degree, between step-parents and step-children, between parents-in-law and children-in-law, be between adopting parent and adopted child. 
between surviving spouse of the adopting parent and the adopted child, between surviving spouse of the adopted child and adopting parent, between adopted child and legitimate child of the adopter, between adopted children of the same adopter, and between parties where one, with the intention to marry the other, killed the other person's spouse or his or her own spouse. Lex Losi, Lex Losi Celebrationis applies only to the extrinsic validity of the marriage, intrinsic validity being governed by the national law of the parties. The exception to the general rule apply only to Filipino citizens, not to aliens. Consequences of marriage, these are 1. Rights and obligations between husband and wife, property relations between husband and wife, family, paternity and affiliation, adoption, support, parental authority, emancipation and age of majority, summary judicial proceedings in family law. General rule, Philippine laws govern all incidents of marriage celebrated in the Philippines. Exception, in mixed marriages, the national law of the husband governs with regards to property relations. Marriage settlement, what governs property regime in order? One, marriage settlement. Two, civil code, absolute community presumed under FC, family code. Three, local customs, general rule. Marriage settlement governs property regime. Exception, when there is no mar marriage settlement existing or effective, Philippine laws apply. Exceptions to the exception, where both spouses are aliens, with respect to the extrinsic validity of contracts affecting property not situated in the Philippines and executed in the country where the property is located. Number three, with respect to the extrinsic validity of contracts entered into in the Philippines but affecting property situated in a foreign country whose laws require different formalities for its intrinsic validity. Foreign marriages. Proof, existence of the foreign law on marriage as a question of fact. Alleged foreign marriage by convincing evidence. Procedure is the same as proving a foreign public document once proven the same acquires prima facie weight as evidence. The solution of marriage. E. Divorce. Divorce obtained by Filipino citizens abroad, not recognized in the Philippines. Then Chavez v. Escano, GR 19671. Facts. Vicenta, Escano 27, and Pastor, Ten Chavez 32, without knowledge of, their Vicent, of Vicenta's parents, contracted a marriage solemnized by a Catholic chaplain. Once the parents found out, it was decided that the marriage should be re-celebrated since, according to Father Reynas, said marriage was invalid for lack of authority of the solemnizing chaplain from the archbishop or the parish priest. The marriage never pushed through, and Vicenta and Tenjavis continued to live separately from each other. Years later, Vicenta went to the U.S. where she obtained a divorce and then married an American. She subsequently acquired American citizenship, but in the meantime, then Chavez initiated legal separation proceeding in the Philippines. Whether or not the marriage between Vicenta and Ten Chavez still exists, Supreme Court held that the marriage was valid and existing. The alleged lack of authority of the chaplain from the archbishop is irrelevant in civil law, not only because of separation of church and state, but also because of the law enforced at the time the marriage was celebrated. On the divorce obtained by Vicenta, the same is not recognized in the Philippines. When the divorce decree was issued, she was still a Filipina, subject to Philippine laws under the civil code. Absolute divorce is not allowed, only legal separation. Supreme Court held that legal separation is proper in this case since Vicenta's marriage to the American is technically intercourse with a person not her husband or adultery and a ground for legal separation from the standpoint of Philippine law. Divorce obtained by alien is recognized in the Philippines. Van Dorn v. Romila, GR 68470. Alice Reyes, Filipina, married Richard Upton, American, in Hong Kong, and then established their residence in the Philippines. Later, Richard obtained a divorce in Nevada, USA. The divorce decree stated that there was no conjugal property. Alice then married Van Dorn. However, Richard, contending that he is still Alice's husband in the eyes of Philippine law, divorce not being recognized here, claimed that Alice's business galleon shop in the Philippines is conjugal property, entitling him to its management. Issue, whether or not the foreign divorce decree can have an effect on property belonging to one spouse held. The general rule that divorce is not recognized in the Philippines applies only to those obtained by Filipino citizens. Aliens may obtain divorces abroad, 
which may be recognized in the Philippines, provided they are valid according to their national law. In this case, the divorce in Nevada released private respondent from the marriage from the standards of American law, under which divorce dissolves the marriage. Thus, pursuant to his national law, private respondent is no longer the husband of petitioner. He would have no standing to sue in the case below, as petitioner's husband entitled to exercise control over conjugal assets, as he is bound by the decision of his own country's court, which validly exercised jurisdiction over him, and whose decision he does not repudiate. He is stopped by his own representation before said court from asserting his right over the alleged conjugal property. Divorce obtained by former Filipino who obtained American citizenship recognized in the Philippines. Lorente v. C.A. GR 124-371 Facts Paula and Lorenzo were married in Camarina Sur before the outbreak of the Pacific War. Lorenzo departed for the U.S. while Paula stayed home. Lorenzo later became an American citizen and upon liberation of the Philippines, he returned to Paula. However, he found that Paula was pregnant and having a living-in relationship with his brother. Lorenzo went back to the U.S. and there obtained a divorce. Then when he returned to the Philippines, he married Alicia. Prior to his death, Lorenzo instituted probate proceeding for the allowance of his will, but died before its termination. Paula then filed for issuance of letters testamentary, contending that she is Lorenzo's legal wife, the divorce he obtained not being recognized in the Philippines. Issue whether or not the divorce obtained by Lorenzo is valid. Held. Lorenzo is a former Filipino citizen who became an American citizen long before and and at the time of 1. His divorce from Paula, 2. Marriage to Alicia, 3. Execution of his will, and 4. Death. While Philippine laws do not recognize divorce, aliens may obtain divorce abroad, subject to the limitation that they are valid under their national law. In a given case, a divorce obtained by Lorenzo being an American at the time he obtained the divorce has legal effects in the Philippines. As such, the first marriage between Lorenzo and Paula is validly dissolved, making the second marriage between Lorenzo and Alicia valid and subsisting. In case of separation, in fact, between the spouse, says the mother shall have the custody of the child under seven years old, unless the court finds compelling reasons. Narisa Perez versus the Court of Appeals in Ray C. Perez. 1-1-8-8-7-0. Ray Perez, private respondent, is a doctor of medicine while Nerissa is wife, who is a petitioner herein, is a registered nurse. After six miscarriages, two operations, and a high-risk pregnancy, petitioner finally gave birth to Ray Perez II in New York, where she worked. When Nerissa came home a few days before Ray II's first birthday, by then the couple was no longer on good terms. She longed to be with her only child, but he was being kept away from her by her husband. So she then filed a petition for habeas corpus asking Ray Paris to surrender the custody of their child to her. The court at Co issued an order awarding custody of the one year old child to his mother, citing second paragraph the Article two one three of Family Code, which provides that no child under seven years old of age shall be separated from the mother unless the court finds compelling reasons to order otherwise. Upon appeal by Ray Paris, the CA reversed the trial court's order and awarded custody of the boy to his father because it would be of the child's best interest and welfare. Who should have the rightful custody of the child held? Custody over the minor Ray C. Paris is awarded to his mother, her in petitioner Nerissa Paris. Since the code does not qualify the word separation to mean legal separation decreed by a court, couples who are separated in fact, such as petitioner and private respondent, are covered within its terms. The Family Code, in reverting to the provision of the Civil Code that a child below seven years old should not be separated from the mother, Article 363, has expressly repealed the earlier Article 17, Paragraph 3 of the Civil Code and Youth Welfare Code, Presidential Decree Number 603, which reduced the child's age to five years old. The general rule that a child under seven years old shall not be separated from his mother finds it reason and the basic need of a child for his mother's loving care. Only the most compelling of reasons shall justify the court's awarding custody of such a child to someone other than his mother, such as her unfit to exercise sole parental authority. In the past, the following grounds have been considered ample justification to deprive a mother of custody and parental authority, neglect, abandonment, unemployment, and immorality, 
habitual drunkenness, drug addiction, maltreatment of the child, insanity, and being sick with a communicable disease. Declaration of nullity and of void marriage and annulment of marriage, the restriction acquired by summons by publication. Ray Ray v. Che Kung Lee, GR 18176. Plaintiff Lazaro Ray Ray, Filipino, seeks the annulment of his marriage celebrated in South Korea to defendant Che Kung Lee, South Korean, whose whereabouts are unknown. Inasmuch as the latter's whereabouts is unknown, and she was formerly a resident of Busan, Korea, summons was served by, by publication. The trial court dismissed the complaint upon the ground that, one, the court could not nullify a marriage contracted abroad, and two, the facts proven do not warrant the relief prayed for. CA affirm issue whether or not the Philippine courts have jurisdiction to allow nullify a marriage contracted abroad held in order that a given case could be validly decided by a court of justice it must have jurisdiction over one the subject matter of the litigation two the person of the parties therein and three in actions in rem or quasi in rem the rest the subject matter of the present case is the annulment of plaintiff marriage to the defendant which is within the jurisdiction of our courts of first instance and in Manila of its courts of juvenile and domestic relations. The same acquired jurisdiction over plaintiff wherein by his submission thereto and consequence of the filing of the complaint herein, defendant was placed under the jurisdiction of said court upon the service of summons by publication. This is an action in REM for it concerns the status of the parties herein and status affects or binds the whole world. The rest in the present case is the relation between the said parties or their marriage tie. Jurisdiction over the same depends upon the nationality or domicile of the parties, not the place of celebration of marriage, nor the locus celebrationis. Plaintiff here is a citizen of the Philippines, domiciled therein. His status is therefore subject to our jurisdiction on both counts. True, that defendant was an under plaintiff theory this is a non-resident alien, but this fact does not deprive the lower court of his jurisdiction to pass upon the validity of her marriage to plaintiff her in. Indeed, marriage is one of the case of double status, and that status therein involves and affects two persons. One is married, never in abstract or a vacuum, but always to somebody else. Hence, a judicial decree on the marriage status of a person necessarily reflects upon the status of another and the relation between them. The prevailing rule is, accordingly, that a court has jurisdiction over the rest, in an action for annulment of marriage, provided at least one of the parties is domiciled in or a national of the forum. Since plaintiff is a Filipino domiciled in the Philippines, it followed that the lower court had jurisdiction over the rest, in addition to its jurisdiction over the subject matter and the parties. In other words, it could validly inquire into the legality of their marriage between the parties herein.